We have the pleasure of welcoming Professor Roy Allison today to a new interview. He is director of the Russian and Eurasian Studies Center at St. Anthony's College in Oxford, previously also of London School of Economics and Chatham House. Thank you very much for joining us to discuss a few of today's current events mm. relating to Russia. My pleasure. If I can start first with a, a moment that I think has really an image that has stuck with a lot of people, and that's this unguarded moment at the G the one lone camera that zeroed in on President Barack Obama and President Vladimir Putin in kind of an unplanned power huddle over Syria. What do you think are the prospects for uh, coordination or at least reduction of tension in Russian and American or Western approaches to Syria? What does Russia hope to achieve in Syria? Well, I think the President Putin realizes that there is no military solution that uh, trying to defeat uh, the opposition militarily uh, is putting himself in an impossible position. So really he's seeking to translate the military presence he has there into political influence, both over the shape of the future administration, however that might emerge, but also more broadly, uh, and I think this is more significant for him, in uh, influence over the regional uh, development in, in, in the Middle East, particularly uh, a, a, a sense of a wider uh, alignment uh, between Russia, Iran, uh, Iraq, uh, and perhaps some um, Hezbollah and, and some other elements. So uh, this, this is something that the Americans are quite conscious of, mm -hmm. uh, and they have significantly different views about how this process of transition away from Assad should develop. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't think that Putin is necessarily wedded to President Assad as, the, as a Syrian leader uh, for the, in, the, in the medium or longer term. Um, in, in fact, I, he, it might even be that uh, he felt when he came to Moscow and met him that Assad was actually not perhaps the, the leader he wished. He, I, I'm, 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 I'm not convinced that they got on very well in that meeting. Yes. Uh, so Putin seeks to have uh, loyalists. He, he seeks, he, he'll be seeking to have someone who is, can be influenced and, uh, and shaped by, by Russian agendas. Uh, and he, how, how that's going to be achieved is not yet clear. Um, in the meantime, uh, Assad represents the, the main political connection he seeks. Uh, but at the same time, uh, he is more ready, I think, to look for alternatives than perhaps Iran. So the, 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 the various alternative uh, positions, um, the, the, I mean, the process towards uh, a, a new Syrian administration has to incorporate a substantial part of the, the, the opposition that has been, has been fighting. But there are deep differences between Washington and Moscow over how that's going to break down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how, if we think about the domestic set of actors around Russia's policies in Syria, how coordinated are these actors? Or do you still see, can you note disagreement over what Russia should be doing in Syria, in Moscow? Or is all relevant stakeholders, all possible power actors, firmly behind the course that Russia is taking at the moment? Well, there's not much you know, public evidence of, of disputes I I emerging. Uh, this is a very hierarchical decision-making uh, process in Russia uh, under, under the president and through the presidential administration. And I think Putin essentially has the, the agreement on his policy from the uh, defense ministry, the uh, security ministries, and, and so the so-called power ministries. Uh, the alternative, those who influence economic policy may have concerns, but really they're not, they're not, they're not particularly influential on, on, on national security policy or really have very little influence. So at, at the moment, uh, there seems to be, among elites, significant support for this position, this line. Mm -hmm. uh, but that could weaken, uh, particularly if it seems that Russia's becoming more caught in a, in a conflict that doesn't ha seem to have any very obvious near or medium term end. And this is because of the, the trauma of Afghanistan, the Afghanistan mm -hmm. involvement, 
uh, in the 1980s. Uh, and uh, also uh, the costs and, and the concerns about casualties that, ha that Russia really hasn't suffered yet casualties. Um, so, and the image would be uh, the, an air war with you know, casualty-free air war. But it's just that kind of war as how it was shown in, in the other, the, 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 the Western uh, commitments in the Middle East, mm -hmm. which can't really resolve politically uh, events on the ground. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Turning to, unfortunately, another crisis, the reason why this image of Obama and Putin in conversation at G20 has stood out so much is that, of course, the relations between Russia and the West are at a quite dramatic low point over the Russia's interventions in, in Ukraine and annexation of Crimea. And the fighting in Ukraine, I understand, is currently picking up. You know, what's next? For, from your studies of Russian pol hmm. foreign policy actors, do you think there's an understanding of how this standoff could eventually be resolved and what the potential hmm. end game is? Hmm. Well, I think the chances of large-scale fighting now are significantly diminished, and partly because um, Syria acts as a diversionary activity, in a sense, and, and a focus of Russian attention, military attention, political attention. Uh, and also, I think that Russia feels now that having scaled back its earlier, more ambitious uh, expectations of being able to uh, support the development of a, some larger territorial unit opposed to the Kiev administration, so uh, they feel that they have and will continue to have significant leverage through the, uh, uh, local, the local actors there in Donetsk and Luhansk over Kiev's central decision-making, foreign policy, security policy, and economic policy, if the Minsk II agreement is implemented in the way that Russia expects. Uh, so Russia's been very supportive of that, and uh, this also would seem to be the way to uh, dampen down conflict for uh, a period of time, um, the, most, the, most, the most, most ready way to do that. Uh, but it does mean that well, it's a, it's a significant and continuing constraint on, on Ukrainian sovereignty. Um, how the, 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 the recent attacks uh, in Paris, the terrorist attacks, will, will affect this, we'll, we'll see in, 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 the, in, in, the, in the near term. But for one matter, um, Putin's now has... There's a lot more impetus behind his effort to try and forge some new grand you know, anti-terrorist coalition mm -hmm. uh, where Russia has at least co-management, if not uh, stronger influence. And to the extent that France at least is prepared to engage closely with Russia on that, it suggests it will be difficult also to, to be, uh, have a policy which is more adversarial to Russia over Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this means that the positions of the European Union on Ukraine, uh, I think, are now starting to become much more fragmented. These, these two conflicts do will interact and, and influence each other, the diplomacy around the two conflicts. Mm -hmm. That's, it's a, absolutely an interconnected picture of relations. One of the main European efforts to respond to Russia's actions in Ukraine have been the sanctions regime. To what extent have you noticed or been able to trace impacts of the sanction regime? Well, the direct impacts on the Russian economy are certainly less, uh, significantly less, I think, than the, uh, the low sustained low, low energy prices and commodity prices in general. Um, the sectoral sanctions are those that uh, have the potential uh, to have longer-term constraints on Russian economic development. Uh, but it will take time, really, for these to, to have some of that effect. And uh, it's mostly in certain, certain areas or niche areas. Uh, I mean, for example, uh, Russia's military modernization has depended heavily upon uh, microelectronic components that have come from the West, which will not be forthcoming. Uh, Deep-sea drilling technology for the development of the Arctic fields, mm -hmm. if and when it becomes profitable to them. Again, um, uh, this won't be coming, and it won't be coming from other sources like China. Um, so th this is obviously concerning for Russia. Um, uh, 
the sanctions directed against individuals have been irritating, but effectively Putin has just he's redirected assets around and made sure that those who were targeted by these sanctions don't appear. They don't feel that they're particularly suffering consequence. Um, so I don't think that has that's had much m much effect in, in in shifting political thinking within within Russia. Mm -hmm. um, the other matter is I I think also that it is very likely that the the two tracks, the American sanctions and the EU sanctions, are going to start to diverge uh, already next year, uh, so that the United States may maintain a substantial part of the sanctions. It's just in the way that um, these uh, these kind of Washington, whereas the U European Union would be more likely to uh, to lift them, um, conditional on 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 significant progress with the uh, the Minsk II. Uh, agreement, although the actual imp the f the implementation of that now has been postponed until next year. It should have been completed at the end of this year. Um, so I, I think that the, cons I mean, the consensus to maintain EU sanctions will be even more difficult now because of the, uh, the apparent uh, uh, rapprochement over Syria, mm -hmm. um, certainly uh, uh, as far as France is concerned. Mm -hmm. That alignment of interests. Mm -hmm. For a final question, I'd like to ask you to speculate or consider a bit a question we often think about as political scientists and international relations scholars, and that's the question of how does domestic politics influence international relations? And I want to ask you specifically this about domestic change attitudes in Russia towards the West. That this, you know, for example, that a, a confluence of interest and capacities may result in a rapprochement in international relations, but to what extent will enemy pictures in the amongst um, or a general nationalistic discourse allow for perhaps a sustaining of that mm -hmm. improvement in East-West relations? Yes, of course. I mean, uh, Russia and Western countries can find some common interests. They can uh, develop relations on a transactional basis, uh, whether it's economics, trade, counterterrorism. Uh, but in fact, they may uh, still be significantly different. It may be very far from a, 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 any deeper partnership. I think it will be difficult to get back to that sense of a, a real partnership uh, working in a, in a common direction towards common goals about economic and societal development, uh, uh, particularly because there has now been this sustained effort to reject uh, uh, some alternative set of values. Um, I think this is very much a political project, but nonetheless, uh, it's one that the Russian government seems to be very committed to, quite far from the European understanding of its identity. So you could say there is, there is an identity clash here, although I think that on the Russian side, it's been developed quite instrumentally. Um, whether we can get back to a, a better sense of... Uh, uh, Common, co common views about international, um, I think, is the key issue here because uh, there's so much concern that uh, Russia has is trying to, in its terms, break out of the old in international international legal order. Um, uh, th 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 this means that there's a, there's no predictability in relations in the future, particularly for the smaller EU countries adjacent to Russia. Um, so even if there's, I think, more of a modus vivendi develops between France, uh, some of the other uh, EU countries, the East Central European countries and the Baltic countries, I think, will remain profoundly affected for a long time by the events in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. I think on that note, we can conclude. Thank you very much for your Thank insightful you. comments.